Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the We Fix Pain podcast. This is episode number two, two, double deuce with Dr. Kathy Dooley. Doc, welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am honored and privileged to be here. Oh, we're grateful to have you and, and respect your time and your massive and enormous talents. All right. The topic of conversation today is translating functional anatomy into functional outcomes. And who better to help us with this topic than a functional anatomist? And we'll get over that. Go, go over that. Excuse me. In a couple minutes uh, here. So the We Fix Pain podcast, our podcast focuses on health and wellness related topics with a specific focus on integrated neuromuscular care. Uh, we discuss injuries to muscles, tendons, ligaments, joints, fascia, bones, and more that lead to pain. We address topics like assessment, diagnosis, treatment, rehab, and management of acute and chronic related uh, musculoskeletal pain related conditions. Thank you for listening for our podcast and watching us. We have uh, episodes on Spotify, YouTube, Anchor, hopefully soon iTunes. And if you like this material, please subscribe and share. Dr. Dooley is a rehab chiropractor practicing at ID Lab in New York in Midtown Manhattan, right in the heart of everything. She also practices via telehealth in Boulder, Colorado. Different views. You got the skyscrapers and you got the mountains. She's an adjunct anatomy instructor, instructor at two uh, medical schools, the New York City Medical Schools, Einstein College of Medicine, and Weill Cornell Medical College. She's an adjunct instructor at NYU, New York University College of Dentistry and Sophie Davis School of Biological Sciences, and is a visiting professor at St. George's University Medical School in Grenada, West Indies. Grenada? Grenada? Uh, Grenada. Mm -hmm. Grenada. Grenada, West Indies. It's like potato, potato. I think I screwed it up. <laughs> yeah. She's also an anatomy expert on demand for AbbVie <laughs> Pharmaceuticals via MedForce. She teaches continuing education for the following seminar companies, neurokinetic therapy, immaculate dissection, and somatic senses. She can be found at Dr. That's D-R, Kathy, K-A-T-H-Y, Dooley, D-O-O-L-E-Y, at gmail.com. Doc, that's a mouthful. Yeah, wow, that was great. You, you did a great synopsis. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a brief uh, uh, a synopsis of your expertise because it's, it's uh, quite extensive, especially in this area. So, Doc, what's your superhero origin story? How did you end up as a chiropractor? And how did you end up diving down this rabbit hole of being a, an anatomy instructor in, in medical schools, dental schools, international? How did you end up uh, along this track? I was studying for my master's degree in nutrition. I think I was, what, 20, 21. I was doing my prerequisites to – I was changing from a, a career of theater, ironically, uh, into more science. I was always a double major, so I was always really interested in science and art. But I uh, was m moving towards uh, doing a master's in nutrition. And so I started to get – well, I remember I was studying for organic chemistry and physics and things like that. I started to get panic attacks, being completely relaxed at rest, and I didn't understand why. And I was getting kind of desperate. I went. I remember going to an uh, emergency room, and they were pretty unhelpful. Um, I, I mean, I, not that they were unhelpful. They were just. I was just really only given the option of medication, and I felt. I felt like that was not complete. I didn't really feel like I had a complete diagnosis, and. I started to talk to more people about it and someone had suggested a chiropractor for management of my panic. And I, I said, well, what does my spine have to do with panic? And this very astute uh, person said a lot, actually, there's a sympathetic nervous system that runs along your spine and you probably should look into the, the possibility of calming down your nervous system with adjustments. I went to a chiropractor. She described to me my reverse lordosis, my reverse cervical curve and how I'd had multiple concussions and heart, car accidents, and no one had ever told me that that might be in a relationship with my panic. I started seeing her, and my panic attacks dissipated without medication. Huh. And I thought, wow, wow that's wow. a really interesting field. So I switched over from my master's degree in nutrition to study uh, chiropractic. I finished those prereqs and then went to Logan College of Chiropractic in St. Louis. That's where we met. You were my anatomy TA. You kind of guided us all down the path of making sure not only we uh, we passed the material, but we were actually were trying to master it and integrate it. You kind of were ahead of the times there. 
it was, it was, I was really lucky. I, the, the chiropractor I saw, she was you know, incredible. She, you know, let me work for her while I was finishing my prerequisite so I could be around chiropractic quite a bit, be around the billing, be around patient care. Uh, it, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience before going to Logan. So, uh, but Logan was an experience all in of itself. It was amazing. What set the trend for life after Logan? Uh, that's where you and I met. And again, you're my anatomy TA. I thank you yeah. for the passion you instilled in us as, uh, as students. And uh, several of my classmates ended up like Frank, Dr. Frankie Scali, yeah. going down the rabbit hole of anatomy as well. So what kind of set the stage for life after Logan? Namely, like how you dive down the rabbit hole of becoming a uh, anatomist for a living in addition to having the hybrid anatomy professor but also a clinical practice. How did that that transition occur post Logan? Yeah, when I was at Logan, I was you know really uh, fascinated with the idea of practicing. It was something that was really interesting to me. And in my last semester, I was you know I, my, a, a plan that I had had to practice uh, in Arizona had fallen through, and I went. I had heard about the New York Chiropractic College's website. They had a, a career database. Uh, and I knew that they had a lot of job postings. So I was thinking, oh, I want to be an associate for someone for a while uh, since this other job kind of fell through. Let me let me look for something else. I accidentally clicked on something incorrect. I clicked on a, the, the link, not to career da- database for jobs, but career opportunities. It was just a, uh-huh. a misclick. And there was, they were starting a pilot program for a master's degree in clinical anatomy. And I, at that time, like you said, I was at, tutoring for anatomy, helping my fellow colleagues to, to pass their exams. And I was really into anatomy quite a bit at that point. I was terrible at it at first, but I w- really dove into it. And I thought, what is this? This is very interesting. I didn't even know there was a master's degree in anatomy. And, and it was a pilot program, so they were just starting it. They were doing a collaboration between medical schools and chiropractic schools to train clinicians to teach anatomy because they had a huge anatomy teacher shortage at that time. So I clicked on the wrong thing and, and ended up with a, a very big career change. Uh, the selection committee chose me. I'm very lucky they chose me out of the candidates that were all very capable. And I got to study under some amazing instructors like Dr. Zampano, Dr. Walker, incredible PhDs at NYCC. And uh, I also got to do externships at the medical schools in New York City, which of course made me fall in love with New York City, which is why I subsequently moved there. From a country girl to a big city girl. <laughs> yes. I, I'm not sure I was ever very country, but being from a, a 1,500-person town in Indiana, uh, I definitely didn't know that I was going to end up in a, a city that's one of the, the biggest in the world. So, uh, But it, it New yeah. York had a certain vibrancy that I'm sure if anyone has visited, they know what I'm talking about. And it runs at my speed, which is fast. <laughs> yeah, or very fast. <laughs> yes. Um, let me uh, let me uh, get to know you question. So, uh, you know, I've known you for a couple of years, our listeners. It's kind of nice to hear people's origin story and kind of, you know, fun random tidbits. I uh, make for good conversation starters. So we do a segment here where we just have off the top of my head questions. These are just coming to me. I'm not prepping these. So your reaction will be as natural as mine. All right. You've <laughs> okay, lectured. Okay. You've spoken. You've spoken. They've spoken at medical schools. You've spoken at conferences. You've been the keynote speaker at lots of places. All right. You're getting prepped. You're getting ready to go. Go out and stage. You got your headphones on. What is the song you're listening to to prep to go out and talk to a thousand people? What do you what what's going what's on that playlist? I, I've never even considered doing that before, to be honest. But it sounds like a really great idea. I think that people like Tony Robbins do that. It would probably be something like the Kill Bill soundtrack because it's very female empowering. So probably that. <laughs> okay. Oh, we'll take it. We'll take it. All right. <laughs> You currently, if I'm not mistaken, reside in Boulder, Colorado, right? Yes. I spend my time between New York City and Boulder. Yes. All right. So uh, I need one uniquely New York experience. Like you can only get this in the Big Apple and one unique Boulder experience. Like keep it weird, Boulder. So give me your most authentic New York and your most authentic Colorado Boulder experience. My friends often joke in both cities that I know nothing about either city because I'm always working. <laughs> but um, 
I would say like part the, the place that I usually take people in New York City should they come to visit me is usually uh, Koreatown and Korean barbecue. If you've not had that in New York City, that's a definitely experience. Um, you should definitely also get on a reservation if you have an American Express card. I'm not an advocate for this. I'm just saying that they have the best views in the city is the Centurion, New York. People always go to like, um, uh, they, they go to like the Empire State Building, which is great. Uh, but if you're wanting to have a really great dinner experience, the Centurion Lounge, you'll thank me later. Gotcha. Uh, for Don't Boulder, put that on my list um, next time I head back. <laughs> um, for Boulder, I mean, I... I, Boulder is kind of sedated. It's really chill place. Um, my husband and I recently went to a really cool light experience. So you can message me and I can send you a link to that. But it's like a meditation light experience where they use mm. light and your eyes are actually covered the entire time and you're looking at visuals and they're just using light to help you with meditation, which is really, really neat. So I would probably suggest people do that. Like a virtual reality type of thing or not not quite? No, it's uh, basically they use audio and then they block your eyes and they're using light over you and you're perceiving it through blindfoldedness. Um, it's huh, one of the trips with things I've experienced. If, if you want to experience like a, a really deep meditation, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. I think it was like $75. It's like not expensive at all, but it's a, a really, they call it a light experience, which it was indescribable. I've never seen anything like it. So that's probably the most interesting thing I've, I've done in Boulder so far. All right, Doc, thank you for all that. Now to the topic at hand. All right, so uh, I'm going to set the stage. I am a practicing chiropractor of approximately about 14 or 15 years. I've been in healthcare for about 22 years after my bachelor's as an athletic trainer and master's uh, as well as an athletic trainer. I've forgotten things about anatomy. And what would you say, what are the most common mistakes that clinicians make that are grinding away, trying to treat patients, what's the number one or number two mistake we make uh, or things that we lose that uh, lose that, you know, we should remember about anatomy at this point in our careers. I'm throwing myself under the bus basically. No, I, I'm really glad that you did because I think it's a very humbling experience to admit what we don't know or what we've forgotten and to come back and study it. A big part of, our, of us being professionals is continuing education. I don't mean just getting credits to satisfy licensure. I mean, really putting yourself into a position where you're trying to understand and learn your patients better so you can do better. One of the things I've learned that I was making a mistake about myself, and I don't blame Logan, I don't blame my continuing education, I more blame myself for not being as curious, is that I would start to use imaging results to try to explain what I was finding in my exam way too much. I'm seeing this not just with chiropractors, uh, I think I would see it actually less with chiropractors than I do with some other clinicians that I co-care with. I think I get frustrated when a patient will come to me and they say, well, I have, you know, this happened just to me, to me yesterday on telehealth, uh, that they had a, a C4, C5 disc herniation, which would affect the C5 nerve root. And she was talking about tingling in her thumb. And I was like, no, <laughs> I don't think that that's probably that probable. I think you probably have a separate issue that's making your your thumb tingle. And uh, the exam, I think, may not show that that radiograph is, or, the, or that MRI is as predictive as you might think. And we, we become a little bit too married to that imaging and forget that we have a neurological exam. Like I said, chiropractors are better, in my opinion, that I've seen worldwide at continuing their neurological exam, understanding the difference between sclerotome referral, organ referral, uh, trigger point referral, radiculopathy, peripheral neuropathy. And I, I mean, my company even made a poster for this to try to help people delineate these things and remember on their wall that they have a responsibility to investigate for the patient. But I would say that's the biggest mistake I'm seeing as far as everyone in rehabilitation. This includes orthopedists, by the way. I'm, I'm not throwing chiropractic under the bus. I'm saying all people need to make a, a, a better effort towards understanding the different types of pain referral and understand the neurological exam should not die just because they have really fancy imaging. I think uh, you bring up an interesting point that different types of problems will have different types of uh, referral zone. And uh, you mentioned a couple, you mentioned the neurological uh, uh, dermatomal, you mentioned sclerotogenous pain referral, trigger point referral. There's obviously visceral referral. Can we break down 
you know, you, you, the, 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 the functional uh, exam, what the pieces would look like if you had a dermatomal, if you had a sclerotomal, if you had a trigger point, and if you had a viscerosomatic. So part A, what would a dermatomal uh, exam or um, presentation look like? Well, when it comes to a dermatome, um, it's a, a, a as I'm sure everyone on this podcast probably knows, but in case you're listening and are interested as a patient, a, a dermatome referral is the referral of one spinal nerve for skin innervation. So it typically involves numbness or tingling, or in the case of neuritis, a, a pain referral down a particular, what I call the zebra stripes of the body, a particular line down the body. It's very long. It typically is both anterior and posterior, meaning front and back of the body. Uh, and that is an important thing. Like for instance, the thumb would be a C6 dermatome, but it would also include part the front and back of the hand, plus the front and back of the forearm, plus the front and back of the brachium, the arm, and the front and back of the upper neck. And, uh, when we are, we're taught to test, sometimes we're taught to test just distally. And I think that that can be uh, problematic because we need to look and see if there is a line of things that are kind of involved. Uh, with sclerotome referral, um, sclerotogenous referral is usually in reference to ligaments, bones, capsules, tendons that are coming from a sclerotome. And a sclerotome is usually something that's derived, most people, to make it short, I would just say like a bone referral. Uh, but it's, it's more than that. And these are referrals that are, they don't match the dermatome. They're what I call a mixture between stripes and patches where they don't follow an exact line of a dermatome and they rarely include uh, the front and backs of things. Like they, they almost always are a patch here and a patch here, but in a line versus like peripheral neuropathy where let's say you have um, a nerve that's pinched down distally by something by muscles or fiber osseous tunnels. These produce patches. So to make things simple, I tell people patches versus zebra stripes versus a mix between patches and zebra stripes. And that usually helps us to delineate uh, some of the three big referrals. With organ referrals, organ referrals are really strange, but almost always have a visceral component. So when you have a viscerosomatic reflex that's actually showing body pain, there almost always is a visceral accompaniment. And there's no big change in position like there tends to be for things like um, sclerotome referrals almost always get better in a certain position. Uh, radiculopathy certainly have exasperatory positions and peripheral neuropathy certainly do too. So when it comes to impacting true nerve impingement, those almost always, and sclerotomes, those almost always have a positional change where organs don't. This requires you to have a really good asking process, a very, very good intake exam, because a lot of people, they'll come to me with referrals that they think are nerve that are actually coming from organ or coming from sclerotome, and they'll skip big parts of my intake because they're like, well, that has nothing to do with my thumb. What does my neck have to do with my thumb? Or what is, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, then I have to ask them anyway when I get into the room. And um, I, I, I know, for instance, if there are skipping parts uh, of my intake that um, I need to do an even better exam because the odds are pretty good that they, if they're willing to skip your intake and, and don't know that the relationships are there, then you need to do an even better job of explaining it in the exam room. Yeah, it's an interesting conversation. And I had this obstacle and challenge yesterday. One of those where after the first four patients or five patients on a Friday, you're like, is it noon yet? You know, um, and uh, I was trying to tell a patient that had shoulder blade pain, pain between the shoulder blades, that it was cervical referred pain into the area around the cervical spine, most likely from a degenerative source. And they're like, but it doesn't hurt me in my neck. And I was like, but we can provoke your symptoms with neck movement. And, you know, um, uh, this is classic for, you know, uh, your pain pattern, dull, achy. You've tried to vibrate, percuss this out. You've tried to roll it out. You've tried to stretch it out. You're not getting to the source. It feels deep in there because you're not actually, it's not a local problem. So how does one go about, this was my obstacle yesterday. This is why I said, is it noon yet on a Friday? How does one go about educating a patient, the clinical aspect, about like a somatic referred pain pattern or about a sclerotogenous referral? I think it's really important to use visuals because most people are visual learners and most people don't have a strong anatomy education or understand referred pain. And so the first thing I'll do is I'll say to them, uh, can you point this out on my wall? 
because I have the poster of the sclerotomes. Uh, maybe you guys have trigger point referral posters. Whatever posters you need to use, use a visual or use like an iPad, pull up pictures, whatever you need to do to, to bring a visual. Do any of these look like you so that they can choose for themselves? They can say, oh, that one is me. And I'm like, oh, this is actually mapped out, referred pain. And they're like, whoa, what does that mean? And, and I usually always default to a heart attack. I'm like, have you ever heard of people's fingers tingling when they're having a heart attack or they, they, they feel referral of discomfort down their arm? And, and they're like, yeah, I have heard that before. I'm like, well, that's actually referred pain. It's uh, information coming into the spinal cord that the brain's getting confused on its perception. And they're like, oh, and I'm like, well, nothing's actually wrong with their arm. You wouldn't treat their arm. What do you treat? And they're like their heart. I'm like, well, there, there you go. That's a, a type of referred pain. So I almost always use organ referred pain because people have a relationship with understanding that they've either had some, a family member that's happened to, or they've seen it in movies or TV shows. So they can understand what that referral means. So the, you know, explaining sclerotome to someone, it's usually the first time they've ever heard that term. I mean, sometimes the first time my colleagues have heard that term. And I, I teach about sclerotomes that's all over shame. the world. And yeah, it, it is a shame. Like I just recently uh, came from Turkey and I would say maybe half of the students had knew what a sclerotome was and the other half didn't. It's not their fault. It's just if you haven't had that kind of education, chiropractor school, we get that education. But in other disciplines, they don't. And if I'm teaching multi, multi, multidisciplinary type of rehabilitation, then they may have never heard of it. So I'm like, okay, first time for everything. That's great. Let's clean your slate and let's let's talk about what this means. And I think it can be really valuable to to use a visual. So I would suggest, you know, my posters, somebody else's posters, uh, pictures and books, whatever you have to do to use a visual, but get them involved, not as a passenger. I think that they're so used to being talked to at rather than talked with. And so ask them, which one of these matches you? Which Because there's other patients that are like you. And then they're like, oh, it's not just me. They want to know that what they're experiencing is not outlier, that what they're experiencing is a common pattern. Doc, let me uh, switch gears here. One of the questions that I fielded from uh, one of my colleagues and one of my actually interests is the integrating deep uh, stabilizing system of the spine. Uh, most people, uh, you know, have, have generally heard about the concept of core stability or uh, some people will call it core strength and putting that in quotes because I don't describe it quite like that. Um, but I get what they're coming from. So what is the spine stabilizing system? What is its role? Why, why, why do we need it? When I talk about it with patients, I call it the intrinsic system, the inner unit system. And it's this highly reactive system trying to keep you in writing reflex and, and make your center of mass proprioceptively stable to react to whatever you're about to do. And that's why you see muscles like transversus abdominis, multifidus, these muscles that are very close to the spine and, and, and connecting our ribs to our pelvis. They're trying to help us react to whatever happens next. And so I, I would call it not core strength at all because a lot of people have core strength but don't have core stability. It would be core reactivity. How does, how does it react based upon what you're about to do? And do you have a programming that serves you or programming that actually gets in your way? And, and patients that they often have never, they, they know core strength, they've done crunches, they've done ab work is what they'll call it, ab work. And then I'll put them in a position of, of core stabilization, like quadruped. And I'll say, without moving side to side or front to back, can you pick up your hand? And when they can't do it, they, they understand what I'm talking about immediately. They're like, oh, I can't do that. I'm like, well, that's actually core stabilization. Your your abdomen didn't have this kind of micro reactivity that needed to occur in order to pick up your hand. Instead, your body shifted side to side or front to back excessively, and that is a sign that your deep stabilizing system has a has an issue. And the deep stabilizing system for those uh, listeners out there, it's a system in the body that's trying to keep us from these little movements, micro movements of the spine, which should not be um, painful. But in folks that don't have this capability, like Dr. Dooley mentioned, they're moving their hand when they're lying on their hands and their knees and they see a shift in their spine. These are like picking a scab or scratching an itch. They can't be a trigger for, for pain. Uh, is that fair? Yeah. I mean, when you think about, um, if you've not heard of the concept of decentration, it's definitely something worth studying. And um, I remember the first time I asked uh, uh, about joint decentration in AI, and it gave me a perfect <laughs> reply back. And I'm like, well, at least people now will understand what decentration is, because it, it's not talked about nearly enough that this micro decentering that uh, you're describing is, is really important, because if it becomes more macro, 
you start to hit nociceptors. Your rich mechanoreceptors are more central in the joint, and then the pain receptors are more in the periphery of a joint. So the more a joint starts to destabilize, doesn't have this intrinsic support, the more easily you'll hit pain receptors. This is not just at the spine. This is at any joint in the body. Gotcha. Gotcha. Doc, let's rewind here. For those people that may have not heard, can you can you go over what is centration? There's some folks yes, that are familiar, some yeah. folks that are not. So can we sure. back it up a second and go over what is centration? So if you imagine centration, if you were trying to uh, make two things kind of meet together, you'd want them to be centered, right? I think about your elbow joint or your knee joint or your spinal joints. If they are able to center on each other, then they're able to exude, execute force with a proper vector, right? So if a joint's not centering, then the body has musculature in the periphery. It has uh, position sensors in order that can actually tighten and attempt to centrate the joint more fully. And centration is, is the point of it is so that you no part of the joint gets excessive load, no part of the, the cartilage gets excessive wear, no part of the bone might has excessive stress so that you might be prone to stress fractures. So the centration is, uh, you know, your ability to approximate two joint surfaces and be able to create an, an, a stabilization that will allow for more force to be born on top of that joint without destruction of it. Gotcha. Gotcha. So how does one going about centrating the joints of of the spine. Um, there's got to be muscles involved. There's got to be physiology involved. There's got to be things keeping this whole component together. What is that process for stabilizing the spine look like? I think that it comes from, first of all, re recognizing that you have two types of curves that you were born with, the kyphosis, the, the curves towards the posterior, towards the back of you. Uh, that's the thoracic and sacrococcygeal segments. So if you think of like your mid-back and what most, most of my patients will call their tailbone, even though it's more than that, that big keystone bone uh, in your buttocks, those are supposed to curve towards the back. And the cervical and lumbar spines are earned curves. They're earned through, you know, propping mechanisms, extension-based activities like uh, tummy time for the baby and, and for the adult, actually. Uh, and so I use a lot of neurodevelopmental positioning to encourage people to maintain these curves. And in the courses I teach, I say things like neck long, chin back, chest wide, ribs down, hips even, lips together, teeth apart, tongue on the roof, eyes lasered forward on a target. And what these are doing is they're trying to get that intrinsic system to stabilize. And my patients very much can repeat these cues back to me. They're like, got it, Dooley. Neck long, chin back, chest wide, ribs down, hips even, eyes laser forward on target, lips together, teeth apart, tongue on the root. And th what this is doing is, is trying to create those lordoses and kyphoses in an even load share. A term that I use a lot with my patients and my students is load share. I want you to be able to evenly share load across these joints without there being excessive extension, excessive flexion, excessive side bending, excessive rotation, to be able to share the load. When it comes to the spine, uh, I honestly, I'll give them a stick. I'll give them a Swiffer sweeper or a broom or a PVC pipe. And I say, I need you to go neck long, chin tuck, chest wide, ribs down, hips even. And I want you to practice with this pipe on three points at your, the back of your skull, between your shoulder blades and at the, the base of where your belt line hits. And I want you to walk around with this stick for a second and understand what it takes to actually create load share in the, in the curves. And then we'll turn it into hinging or squatting or a push up or a pull up or, and it's, they're shocked at how challenging it is to maintain load share with a pole on their back, like maintain an all fours position with a pole on their back or do a, a deadlifting or a hinge with just the pole. And I'm like, well, imagine what your body has to experience if you're not, if you don't have a, a decent load share between these segments and you try to do something demanding for the system. So I think an easy way to do it is a simple poll and a couple of cues. Doc, so we're talking about stabilization here. What structures in the spine can suffer premature wear, premature stress from not being able to centrate, not being able to load share? Um, in the cervical spine in particular, um, the discs don't nearly experience so much duress as in the lumbar spine. Um, the cervical spine, your the uncovertebral joints, the joints that are in the front, are a special joint for the neck. So if someone, I worry about the the the, the phone generation, the smartphone generations, where uh, they had a lot. I, I'm so lucky I didn't have those phones during my neural development 
but I'm, I'm seeing like my nieces and nephews and they are swiping and constantly looking down and they're not really looking up. And, and so there's a lot of wear that can happen in the front of the neck and those joints are supposed to prevent shearing of the spine uh, and, and protecting the nerves and protecting the spinal cord. But if you put down too much bone, if you move too much through those segments, through things like anterior head carriage, it can lay down extra bone in the neck. So those are, those are a spot as well as the facet joints. Um, facet arthropathy is, is less defined in the neck as it is in the lumbar spine. I think because we, our facets are facing more transversely. So we're, with gravity, I don't think we lay down as much um, hypertrophy of bone in the facets, but we do create stenosis like crazy in the intervertebral area. So cervical stenosis is a growing problem, I think, because we, again, don't have that load share. We don't have good neck control. So um, those are particular spinal areas that receive a lot of wear. The thoracic spine um, is more prone to things like compression fractures, uh, especially as we age, uh, again, because of hyperkyphotic activity, again, an improper curve there, the improper load share. In the lumbar spine, of course, most people are concerned about the discs. I'm just as concerned about the facets for people. I see just as much discogenic pain as I do uh, facet pain. Both of those are sclerotome referrals. And if something graduates to a disc herniation, then you're dealing with radiculopathy. So, um, of course, the, the facet joints and their capsules, uh, very problematic. And, and then, of course, the discs. In, in the sacral coccygeal spine, we worry about this less because it's mostly fused uh, in our development. But um, those are the spots that you have to worry about the wear and tear the most. Doc, so one of the key things that the last couple of years, and it's not that I ignored it, I actually, um, and I think all of us for a long period of time undervalued this anatomical component would be the end plate. What is, is the end plate? What is the role of the end plate in <clears throat> spinal pain? And what's the role of the end plate in that degenerative cascade for some of the joints of the spine? This is probably more of a question for Stu McGill because he's obsessed with the end plate. Right? Uh, I know but, that's um, that when I first read his yeah. book, that's kind of where I picked it up. And I was like, oh, this could yeah. be the missing link for some cases yeah. of axial low back pain that you don't have good solutions to. Well, now you're talking about sclerotome pain again. And I think it's an un, a sclerotome, sclerotogenous referral is one of the more underestimated pain generators of the body. And one of the reasons I think chiropractic works so well is because we can, you know, temporarily and even permanently help people to prevent some of that referral. The end plane is a transition point. What's so interesting about it is the disc is largely vascular, right? Because it's fiber cartilage. The end plane bone is highly vascular. And when you're coming to an end plane, you're coming to a transition point between something highly vascularized and something that's not. And there's a lot of force being transferred through the disc into the bone and vice versa. Uh, and so the, the end plate and the transition between those spots becomes a really important place. I'm going to come back to my favorite phrase, which is load share. Uh, if an end plate does not have, you know, proper load share shared across that lordosis, uh, it's, I'm using the lumbar spine as an example and cervical spine, then it's very easy to create what we usually coin degenerative joint or disc disease because you don't have, you have too much pressure on one spot. I mean, think about it. If you have a paper clip and you bend a paper clip on one spot, it breaks at that spot. So it's very easy to create changes of the implant. And when you start to really mold, and we see this on MRIs all the time, and even on, on x-rays, you can see the, the remodeling of the end plate. Like you'll see osteophytosis, bone spurring, you'll see cracks and, um, and schmorls nodes, and it, 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 you'll see things that you, you'll really know that had to happen due to most likely force being placed upon it. And then with people's hyper obsession of the disc, I, I, I want them to be obsessed with the disc, but I don't believe in parts. And I think that, that Dr. McGill has gotten people really interested in, in sclerotome referral and not just herniation. Like a patient could come to me and say, well, I don't have a disc herniation, but I have back pain. I'm like, well, here's the irony is that most people with disc herniation don't have back pain. They have nerve referral. So your pain that you're experiencing is, is sclerotogenous. It's, it's, you know, related to the bone and the disc itself. And that we need to change the dynamics of the way you move because it, it it's the way what you're doing is putting too much pressure on one spot. Doc, uh, we talked about um, centration. We talked about uh, some stabilization briefly. Are there specific strategies out there uh, for stabilization? Uh, I'm aware of three major ones: the halo, the brace, and then this concept mm -hmm. of intra-abdominal pressure. Can you kind of go over? strategies and then the pros and cons of each strategy for stabilization of the spine? Well, there's so much argument between this and conflicting research on to what you should do. But 
I will say there's benefit to all three, depending on the situation that you're in. Um, one of the reasons I think that I, I work with gymnasts and I used to work for a gymnastics team in New York and they, you would think that they had a lot of back pain, but a lot of them don't. And even in, despite the fact that they had pars fractures because of hyperflexibility, they would, you know, b literally break the, the, the posterior segments, the, the posterior neural arch in their spines, but they didn't feel as much pain as I, as I suspected that they would feel because they had so much practice and things like hollowing and bracing. Uh, they had so much strength and conditioning towards the front that them feeling that scleratome referral from the pars fracture was, was really much harder. Uh, and sometimes the parents would be very surprised when the, the, they would, you know, x-ray the spine because they figured they may have scoliosis or something. So they would get, you know, your standard x-rays and they would see that there was fractures in the child's spine. They're like, how does she not feel that? Like she doesn't feel that because she's an athlete, because she's using, you know, different abdominal techniques. They feel it when they don't do those conditioning techniques anymore. So there's a lot of debate between the hollow and the brace. Um, I think that a, a hollow can make sense in certain situations. I don't coach a hollow very often. I don't feel like the majority of my patients benefit as much from the hollow, but they will tell me that they do a hollow and they get some pain relief. And so I, I say to them, well, a hollowing is a narrowing, a, a, a concentric contraction of some of the deep intra-abdominal muscles. And I can see how that would create moments of stabilization for what you could be doing. Um, bracing makes a lot more sense to me and some of the, the stiffness that you create around the spine because um, a brace would be, you know, not being able to allow something to change. A hollow, you're changing the position of the spine, whereas a brace, you're eliminating the position of the spine. And, and bracing kind of goes along with intra-abdominal pressure building where now you're using air uh, to prevent movement of the spine. So they're all really, really different. I think they all have their place. And one of the hardest things to coach, I think, in my, my patients and my students is when to use what. And I do think it, it's a lot more patient dependent and, and position dependent. So I talk to my patients about where do you feel the least amount of comfort in your spine doing what activity? And let's experiment with whether or not, you know, intra-abdominal pressure building, which is the key thing I, I coach, is, is something that makes more sense. When do we inhale and when do we exhale to make sure that your spine moves the least but has the most amount of share of load across it? And is there moments of brace that are very helpful? You betcha. If you're getting ready to take a punch to the gut, if you're getting ready to pick up something extremely heavy off the ground, build your intra-abdominal pressure and then hold that inhale to be able to pick something up because we really don't want movement to occur. In a hollow, what's interesting is that I've seen patients really benefit from hollowing when they're doing activities that are more flexion biased. And we, uh, and maybe Dr. McGill would not agree with me because, um, he can be quite anti-flexion, but flexion is a component of the way that we move through the spine. So I think that hollowing can be a really interesting piece for a gymnast or somebody that's doing a lot of tumbling or someone that does jujitsu and is doing a lot of rolling. Uh, if someone, something's doing, something's doing, someone is doing something that is a little bit more flexion biased, that can, if you have a, a nice, strong abdomen, a hollow can certainly be beneficial. I'm not sure I get why people do the hollowing and do the like abdominal rolling thing. Like, I know that's a really big TikTok thing and Instagram thing. I just don't know what benefit that has for my patients. So I, I don't really cue that. And I've had patients ask me, can you do that belly rolling thing? And I'm like, no, I can't do that. I wouldn't even, it doesn't occur to me to try that because I spend the least amount of my time practicing hollowing and, and more, way more time with bracing and intradominal pressure building because I feel like it has more life carryover than a hollow does because a hollow is going to promote flexion. Um, just to rewind here, a hollow, just for our listeners that may or may not know, is a sucking in, like sucking picture you're going to a pool party. Yeah, like <laughs> picture you're going to a pool party, right? Yes. You're sucking in pool party and, and or taking a picture. And uh, temporarily for a short, brief period of time, you may actually create a reduced stabilization or reduced compressive force. A brace is the 100% polar opposite where you push out maximally and you need that for specific uh, maximal lifts to create stabilization. The consequence of the brace, though, appears to be higher compressive forces. And the inner abdominal pressure is kind of the middle road. It's task specific. You ramp it up, you ramp it down, depending on what you need. I'm just trying to keep it a little simple for our audience yeah. here. Yeah, hey, Doc, think of like, 
I would want to hollow if I were like rolling over, uh, if I were like maybe doing a, a somersault. I would want a, a brace if I were getting ready to pick up something that was a little bit heavier than my capacity. And I would want intra-abdominal pressure building through most of my activities of, of lifting where things are really moderate. So just think of it at, 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 you know, at being a little bit more specifically activity-based. Yeah, it's a spectrum. You got both yes. ends polar and you have something in the middle. Doc, let's right. talk about the shoulder. Let's talk about the shoulder here. So the anatomy of the shoulder joint, the glenocumulo joint, and the shoulder itself is actually interesting. It is an area that is very, very wired for motion mm -hmm. and, and not very wired for stabilization. Can you talk about the intricacies of the shoulder, the glenohumeral joint, and the other articulations of the shoulder as it relates to shoulder pathology and creation of stabilization or loss of stabilization? I have a, an entire course, a 15-hour course developed on this. It's a really, I'll try to make it simple. You want to think of your shoulder as six physiological joints, six that are, and it's the most mobile joint of the body, a set of joints of the body with the least amount of stabilization because you have to sacrifice stability if you're going to permit that level of mobility. And as primates, we have enormous mobility through the shoulder girdles because we're evolved from something that swung through trees. Uh, so it's uh, important to, to consider the fact that we have to have quite a bit of mobility through this joint, much more than, let's say, the, the ball and socket joint of the hip. So you have a complication because the one joint begets the other joint's mobility and stability. So we have the scapulothoracic joint, which is a completely functional joint. Uh, we wouldn't call it a physiological joint. We would call it more functional because you have, I'm sorry, six functional joints, three physiological joints of the shoulder. The scapulothoracic joint is, um, should be called scapulothoracic costo cervical cranial joint because you have all of these <laughs> muscles that are going from basically your neck, your thorax, your head, your rib cage over to your shoulder blade. And these have to create a platform for what's going to happen next within the articulations of the scapula. So your shoulder blade makes a joint with your clavicle. That's called the AC joint, a chromioclavicular joint. And then that clavicle makes a joint with your sternum, which is the sternoclavicular joint, which is the sole joint responsible for your arm being attached to your axial skeleton, your center of line, which is shocking to think about. We only have one joint that does that. And the glenohumeral joint is where your humerus, your long bone of your arm, is making a joint with your scapula. And that is that particular joint, it's the most movable joint of the body. It's a ball and socket joint, a spheroidal joint that has enormous range of motion. You have a labrum there that acts as a functional joint uh, to create uh, incredible capabilities of this very, very big round humerus to stabilize on a very kind of skinny ovoid labrum. I always liken it to balancing a, a, a softball on a golf tee. Like it's very tough. So the labrum widens it out so you can, you know, articulate those two surfaces better. So the labrum itself serves as a functional joint. And then the long head biceps brachii has to attach to that labrum. And so it has to go through um, a split between some of your rotator cuff muscles. And it's, it's protected along with the rotator cuff muscles by a subacromial bursa, a huge fluid filled sac that also acts as a partial functional joint. So the joint, joint by joint, uh, uh, you know, you have to kind of think about, um, well, joint structure and function talks about this. My favorite book on biomechanics talks about there being six, you know, of these uh, functional joints. And you, the hard part of my job, I think, with stabilizing someone's shoulder is that you have to account for all six. Like if someone has subacromial bursitis, they could have the most beautiful glenohumeral joint with no labral tear in the world, but they still can't reach their arm overhead, right? Because the bursa is inflamed and it's pinched. That's one of the most common causes of subacromial pain syndrome, like pain, like right at the shoulder. And then if you have a labral tear, like I'm sure Dr. Mike Reinold would tell you, like that that's going to majorly change the way that the shoulder functions. And even though it's not the the joint itself, it but it is inside of the joint and it's largely impacting the way that you move through it. The, for, the way I start with patients is what I call STSCAC. I start with making sure that the AC joint and the SC joints, the two clavicular joints, are stable and mobile. And then I look at the scapulothoracic joint. Because if somebody, well, for instance, you can try this at home. Uh, if you have a glenohumeral joint problem, most people want to crank away at your glenohumeral joint. But what if you have a problem with your clavicular position for the scapula? Or if you have a problem with all those muscles that go from head, neck, uh, over to the scapula, as well as the thorax to the scapula? Like, 
I give my patients an experiment. Raise your shoulder to your ear and then try to reach your arm behind your back. You're not going to be able to do it. And most of the time when we're testing glenohumeral humor movement, we ask the patient to reach their arm behind their back. Well, they'll say, I've been doing all these rotator cuff things and I still can't reach my arm behind my back. And I'm like, well, it's because you have a scapulothoracic joint problem. You have an STS-CAC joint problem. And so like if you're you have to account for all six of those joints. You have to account for all six and you have to give respect to, to all six and see which one is causing the biggest amount of mobility restriction or stability dysfunction, stability motor control dysfunction within that joint. And that is the hard part. When someone says, I have a shoulder problem, I'm always like, oh man, here I go. I got a lot of work to do to see which part of these six functional joints is the biggest problem maker and how that evolves between visits for my patient. You talked about the concept of centration stabilization for the spine. Let's flip it. And let's turn this towards the shoulder. How does one go about creating stabilization centration of the multiple, multiple joints of the shoulder? Well, after you get the spine set, remember the cervical spine is a big part of that scapulothoracic joint. It's a big part of that shoulder joint. And everything innervated by the upper extremity is coming from C5 to, to T1. So you have to really make sure the person has good cervical stabilization first. So if you have good centration and good stabilization through the cervical spine, then you can move on to the upper thoracic spine and then into the shoulder girdle. So I'll usually start with trying to get their, their neck and thorax and shoulder blade in, in good positioning. So I'll make sure that they can do things like simple things like elevation, depression, protraction, and retraction. So if you don't know what those terms mean, raise your shoulders up and bring your shoulders down. Do they look even on each side? Right. Uh, and I don't need them to be perfect because we have handedness. I just need them to have general symmetry that one needs to not be beating out the other. Right. And then I look for them to protract, which is reaching out for a hug and then retract, which is pulling back away from your hug. And I look for that to be, again, even low chaired, and I look for it to be generally uh, symmetrical between sides. And if I don't find that, I look at the muscles that do those actions. Elevators would be things like upper trapezius, levator scapula. Depressors would be things like pec minor, lower trapezius. If I think protractors are not even, I look for things like serratus and pec minor. And retractors, things like, again, levator and the rhomboids and mid-traps. So you, you have to know your anatomy or you're dead in the water you're guessing. And so if you're not already studying the anatomy uh, again and over again and for the rest of your life, I'm just going to highly advise that whether you do it with me or with somebody else or do it on your own. I think that it's extremely advisable to study, study, study the different joints and what's moving and, and understand where the person has uh, their restrictions. And then I would move into, uh, you know, getting that clavicle moving with the shoulder blade. And then I would move to the humerus. The humerus is the last on my list. The reason why is because if the scapula is moving all over the place and doesn't know where to go relative to the spinal components and the clavicular components, the humerus is going to create a locking mechanism. The muscles that are going from the shoulder blade over to the, the humerus, the long bone of the arm, they're going to decelerate like we talked about earlier. They're going to lock into place, which is why people have such tight rotator cuff musculature. When you start to palpate things like supraspinatus or infraspinatus, you're like, why are they so tight? Because they have to be. You can't foam roll out. You can't bring mobility to a stability problem. That's a great cook quote, right? And he's really, really right about that. So if you're, if you're trying to like do your rotator cuff exercises and like, ee, 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 you know, back and forth with your band and, and then you're trying to roll it out with a lacrosse ball, but it, it doesn't have the permission to relax then give it permission by going more proximal. Try to figure out the, the muscles that are going from central line, things like the spine over to the shoulder blade or from the, the, those same spots to the clavicle. Uh, look at things, like don't underestimate things like upper trapezius, some clavius, some of these muscles that are controlling the, the clavicle. Don't underestimate uh, things like the rhomboids and levator scapula and serratus. Serratus is one of the biggest muscles of the human body, it goes from the medial border of your scapula and it attaches to nine ribs. And we've all seen how dysfunctional that particular muscle can be. And it's innervated by the lower cervical spine. So make sure the lower cervical spine and big muscles like that are stable before you even touch someone's rotator cuff. Because if you start giving people rotator cuff exercises when they don't have stabilization proximally, uh, you could actually create more issues for the patient. 
because now you're strengthening something that's actually already overly stabilizing the humerus in its socket and, and limiting its freedom. If you want freedom, you have to have permission to be free. <laughs> you have to have the permission to relax. And so I tell people when you have someone with a adhesive capsulitis like frozen shoulder, or you have someone with a rotator cuff pathology, you have someone with a labral tear, don't be afraid to go proximal first. You have several visits with this patient. Don't be afraid to do that first. Doc, what have you found to be some of the best choices for you in terms of exercise selection? Every exercise has a utilization. Every exercise has a choice as a pro and a con. What have you found effective for you in terms of exercise prescription, um, sets, reps, loads, names of exercises to be effective for you to create the, the changes that you want uh, with, with your patients and the outcomes that you want? This is the thing. I, I think that what I do would probably be different within what you would do. It'd be different within the next person does. Uh, I think that it's most important that you find something that works for the person in front of you that they can relate to. And so I used to be really, really married to maybe like six or seven exercises. And I would always do those exercises. And then I started to, to widen my mind a little bit and ask them what they gravitate towards doing. Because no exercise is going to be effective if they don't do it. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm an out-of-network chiropractor in New York, okay? Like, I might only get a couple of visits with somebody because they may not want to pay for my services if they can get something in-network. So I've got to make a huge impact fast on my patients. So I would say that there are no bad exercises. That you, you really want to think about how the person is executing them. I'm really into the person filming exercises and giving you know them back to me so I can look at them and analyze it. But I would say, for me professionally, I gravitate towards uh, a lot of things that provide maximal stability points. Like I like a lot of quadruped. I like for things to have... I don't know why my patients have been told, or maybe it's just intrinsic within our system as bipeds to not use their fingers or not use their hands. And I'm like, have you, and then, so I show them the somat sensory, uh, uh, somatosensory homunculus. I show them the, the weird guy with the big hands and the big lips and the big face. And I'm like, why would you not want to use your hands? That's crazy. And they're like, oh, it's weakness. It's, and I'm like, no, it's not. It's you connecting to your environment better at your cortex. And so I've even considered having that like 3D printed and put it in my office because I'm like, we, you should know that it's okay to use your hands. And so I try to get people to, to use as many points of contact as possible and provide more stability for themselves. Uh, I use things like tripods of the hand, uh, talk about the triangles of support for the hand and foot. Uh, I, I give them, of course, the cues I was telling you about, neck, long, chin, tuck, chest, by ribs, down, hips, even. And then I start to ask them, what do you like to do? What are you already doing? Let's make what you're already doing even better. Because erasing what they're already doing and giving them new exercises may not be the right idea either. Because now all of a sudden they have 20 exercises to do. And so if I, I work with other chiropractors and other PTs, I'm not going to make my colleagues wrong. I'm going to make it more effective. So rather than be married to a couple of exercises, ask them what they're already doing and see if you can stabilize them in those positions that they're already doing. Teach them how to do better bracing or intra-abdominal pressure building. Teach them how to use their tripods better. Uh, coach them through... Uh, micro movements, small movements where their spine's not allowed to move and, and see if they can stabilize better. But I do find that I give a lot more stability exercises and isometrics than I do isokinetics and a lot of big movements. I just work on their stability and get them to, to move in, in progression. So I usually call them like progression A, B, C, D, E. If you're on progression A, progression A is awesome. Make sure you nail that and then we'll move on to B. But you, you might be someone who gravitates towards SFMA or DNS, or maybe you like strong first. I mean, I, I do a combination of kettlebells and bands and neurodevelopmental positioning. And, but most of the time, the first question you probably should ask them is what are you, what are you already doing? What can we make? If, if it's good, if, if it's really probably a pretty good thing to do, how can we make it better? How can we make it even more suitable for what you're doing now? And when I started doing that, I started getting a lot of referrals from colleagues that wanted to work with me and co-care with me because they knew that then they were an island of one person just trying to help someone. But now we had a team of people that were on the same page. And I think it's all, I think we forget that in our hubris that it's about the patient. It's not about doing some magic exercise. I'm sure McGill's big three are awesome exercises, but I, I've seen those not go well for patients because they weren't given patient specific cues for their centration. So if you have a PT that's given them McGill three and like they're doing 
curl ups and they're doing bird dogs, but they're messy in their stabilization. And I'm going to say, can we just bring this down to the elbows or can we like slow down the motion, use a slider? Can we like make sure that the right parts are moving and let's, let's, let's show, let's show this off to your PT the next time you see them. And I, I've gotten a lot more uh, of these great opportunities for co-care when I've done that. That's just something I've learned over the last, you know, 18 years of, of being now in clinical practices, the mistakes I made in the beginning was, was trying to, to outdo other people and do the right thing rather than, than care with someone to do the right thing. It's about the patient. It's not about you. So the best exercise is the one that they can do successfully that get them out of awareness. And that might be very different person to person. Yeah, I think you hit a couple high points and a, a couple high points are, um, A, keep it simple. I think the, the moment that we introduce a new task to them is motor learning required. So that's going to take weeks and weeks and weeks to build some competency. So if you can, like a, a batting coach, a hitting coach in baseball, sometimes we don't try to change your hitting form. We just try to make you better at what you do and make you aware of what your weaknesses are. So, yeah, I like that approach. And uh, the more I get into it, I started at reverse. I started as a strength training and conditioning coach ended up as an athletic trainer, then as a sports and rehab chiropractor. So like, you know, I've gone from like trying to teach people how to squat and deadlift to literally trying to teach people how to get out of bed. Right. Completely different, life changing, but you know, there's value in teaching somebody how to roll over. Like no joke. Um, you don't, you, you wake up on the wrong really side of the bed. Is how to roll over when you yeah. Yeah. If you, if you can get exactly. out of bed, I mean, I've had prime athletes that can't get out of bed, you know, they're like, Oh my God. And it's extremely yeah. humbling, but the, the, as you widen your expertise and, and really look at the person in front of you, help the person in front of you and be authentic, be aware. And, and I think that we can sometimes forget as clinicians that the whole reason we have a job is to make the person successful. Uh, and a coach starting out as a coach before you were a medical professional is probably a real highlight. I would suggest that to anyone. I was a coach too. I was a not strength and conditioning. I was a personal trainer before I was a, a chiropractor and I'm really glad that I was. Doc, let's flip, uh, flip, flip uh, segments here a little bit. And let's talk about some unique uh, anatomical considerations in the body. Tendons, tendinopathy. Let's deal with tendons. Why, they, why do they get <laughs> so pissed off and why are they so hard to calm down? Yeah. Tendons are, you know, that sclerotome referral again, they, they are derived from something very similar as bone. They're highly avascular, but pain productive. I liken them to something like the SI joint where they're not supposed to have a ton of movement, but they can produce a lot of pain when they're asked to do more than they're prescribed to do. And I think that the tendons and nerves, they're, they're usually angry toddlers. They, when something's wrong, they throw a fit and let you know about it. And the pain is not necessarily indicative of the severity of the problem, which is really confusing for my patient. Like, let's say I have a patient come in with um, medial epicondylitis, like uh, el elbow tendonitis. They'll, they'll come in and they'll, they'll say, gosh, every time I golf or every time I, I play tennis, I feel this in my elbow. And I'm like, okay, great. They'll have their imaging and show that they have uh, tendinopathy. And they're like, how long is this going to be? And I'm like, well, research says, you know, 12 to 16 weeks. I'm going to tell you it's probably going to be longer. And I want you to have a realistic expectation of the, the length of time that this might be pain provocative. Now, you're only at really a big risk in the first 16 weeks because your body, the tendons are special because they have to lay down this really interesting collagen matrix and they don't have contractility. They are connecting bones typically to something like a, a muscle. And so they're relying on the, the blood supply from bones that's nearby that they're also getting. And they're relying on the muscles doing the things that will promote them not getting a, a disruption of their collagen matrix. So we're trying to lay down, it's basically like trying to paint a fence when the fence is moving. That, that's, it's really, really tough. So I tell people like one of the greatest ways to, to approach tendons is something that's that kind of was popular in 2015 and then fell off. And I don't know why it fell off. And that's tendon neuroplastic training. There was this huge study with, with the British Medical Journal, uh, and then it just kind of died away. And you don't see as much of it anymore. But I, I employ some of those tactics with my patients. And uh, my husband's a strength athlete. He's an isometric strength athlete. And he talks about the importance of tendon strength and how important it is to lay down thick and, and supportive tendons. And 
I, I've noticed also an influx of people that are doing like anti-aging and testosterone injections where the tendons tend to be a little bit weaker and things like testosterone injections and they're getting more tendinopathies. And they're like, oh my gosh, I feel this pressure on me all the time to help people with their tendinopathies. It's one of the harder things to treat in clinical practice. So the the things that you want to encourage is that tendon neuroplastic training, like heavy, slow contractions, consistent resistance, slow, heavy contractions are really important. So isokinetic exercise, let's say you're doing a bicep curl and you're doing one and two and three, that is not going to give you a good response from the biceps tendon. That's going to give you a good response from the biceps muscle, right? The biceps tendon would want you to do that really slow eccentric position and then a really slow concentric position. That is how the tendons respond because they're responding a little bit more like the piezoelectric effect of bone. They're going to really want to, to lay down a matrix due to heavy, slow contraction. So that's what they found in that, that big study by BMJ. And I, when I, I remember when I read it, I was like, whoa, that is not something I was really I, – I was aware that a lot of bodybuilders did like controlled eccentrics and they got really big muscles out of it. But that's also how they have really strong tendons. And I was like, oh, that's why they don't – rupture tendons as much if they're like a natural bodybuilder and they're doing slow eccentrics. So I started to incorporate that into my clinical practice and I noticed my patients got better faster. And then I tried to, when they would try to Google it, you wouldn't find anything. They're like, can, Dooley, can you give me a TNT exercise, tendon or plastic training on the Achilles? That one's easiest to find. Or can you give me one for the medial epicondyle, for the common flexor tendon? Can you give me one for uh, the hamstring? And then I found myself designing some of these things for my patients and, and saying, look, you just have to do it really slow and like you're under a heavy load, like you're moving in molasses. They, the, the athletes that they did in the study had to move so slow that they had to use a metronome to slow them down because they would try to do it too fast. So I would tell was you like- the silver, Was that the Silver study? I remember yes. looking at the research by Cook and then the research yes. by Silver, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I think the BMJ uses uh, that as one of their references, but they they- they pull, it's like a, a meta-analysis, right? So they're bringing in multiple sources, but that's one of the sources that they quote. And uh, the, w what's, what's fascinating, I started to employ that uh, in myself. I started to employ that in my patients and they would get better faster. It's still not fast. Tendons are just not fast. And they're, they can, they're pain receptive. They have Golgi tendon organs and uh, they respond in an appropriate receptive way with a tension response. So you have to really tell them there may be pain provocation, but as long as the pain is not escalating, then it's probably okay what you're doing. But if you're feeling an escalating awareness, you got to stop because you're, you're splitting out the matrix and, and you're hitting pain receptors. It's not about centration pain. This is a different kind of nociception. This is uh, localized to the matrix. And, um, that that really consistent heavy slow contraction is not what a lot of people are doing in their training. They're like pushing weight or they're running laps or they're swimming laps and they're just not doing a lot of heavy slow contraction. I think that's a big part that's missing in a lot of people's training. So if we can add more TNT into their training, into their rehabilitation, we'll probably find, you know, a more resilient tendon. Optimal dose. Uh, exercise is a drug. There's a prescription. There's a therapeutic dose. When you're dosing somebody yep. with a, t a tendinopathy, whether it's um, you know slow, slow controlled contractions, what's your dosage strategy typically typically look like? I know it's well, and it I depends, mean, but yeah, best, it is. Best it, guess. it is going to depend. I know that's the worst answer ever. Is it depends and it does depend. But I would say for tendons, because you're doing heavy slow contractions and you're moving in molasses, that three three reps is really pretty good. Um, so you're not giving people, I rarely give people exercise prescriptions of 10, this random number. I look more at, well, how many reps are they able to do without pain provocation, with the ability to maintain stabilization points, with the ability to not override fatigue? Uh, and so the rep schemes are really tough because I think they're very patient dependent, but I know I've already said that it depends. So I will say um, with, with TNT, the magic number typically is around three and that usually takes somewhere, you know, between 30 and, and 60 seconds. So I don't need them doing rehab for, you know, hours a day. I probably want them, especially with tendinopathies, to do that 60 seconds multiple times a day, like a Pavlovian response, rather than you know them doing it as just a warm up. But if they're lifting weights and they feel provocation, like let's say they have elbow pain and they it really hurts to hang from a bar or do a pull up, then I'm like, well, maybe you do you restrict your range of motion to a less painful range where it's not escalating, and you do your TNT in between sets. So it's a really great way to sneak in the amount that they're doing and they're only doing three reps and they have to rest anyway. So they can do an active recovery with yeah, that going, 
that coincides with some of the, my recommendations, time under tension. When I typically, as an entry level, at least for me, isometrics are easy to do. You can do them anywhere. Um, and typically I'll have, you know, 10 to 10 to 12, uh, you know, repetitions of like five to 10 second holds. So I think, you know, your one minute of hold time and my one minute of hold time are that time under tension is similar. And then when I progress to eccentrics, 10 to 12 reps, five second eccentric. So I think we're on board with a total amount of time under tension. Just we're coming about it from two different angles. So, yeah. And uh, just like there's two, you know, different ways to get to a destination through various highway systems. I think that you can train tenons in different ways. I, I just, you know, I've personally experienced that really controlled eccentric, really controlled concentric with a heavy, slow resistance to be. I mean, really game changing for someone with tendinopathy, and and they're almost never suggested that to do that by their orthopedist or um, their PTs. But I think that we can help change. Talk another anatomical consideration in the body, and I was guilty in my athletic training career, um, bachelor's and master's, of not having any recognition of this. And start until like the mid to late two thousands that I became aware of, you know, the potential for articular cartilage lesions, especially when I'm seeing them in the ankle weight-bearing athletes and in the knee, um, what, what, what is the relevance of articular cartilage? What problems does an articular, articular cartilage lesion create? And it can be more than the foot and the knee. Those are just the two areas where I typically see them the most. What is the articular I, cartilage and why is it a problem? I think it's a great question. I am thoroughly convinced that articular cartilage wear is one of the biggest pain provokers in people with osteoarthritic changes um, in joints. And we can blame osteophytes, which are certainly pain generators, and we can blame, you know, subchondral sclerosis and things like, you know, damage underneath the cartilage line. But because, you know, the cartilage is is this very alive thing, I, I think that it makes a lot of sense to look at, at cartilaginous wear. And where I see people focus on it a lot is at the hips and people with osteoarthritic changes, whether they're going to decide and they use the term bone on bone, which is my least favorite term. But what they're really saying with bone on bone is that there's a wear of articular cartilage. And I think that um, some of the, the, the changes in biomechanics can really not only encourage and nourish the articular cartilage, that part is, is really fascinating to me, but you know, improper biomechanics can damage the cartilage. Like they've shown that people always assume running is bad for your knees. And I'm like, well, actually a lot of people that have been distance running for like 60, 70 years, they actually have better cartilage than people that don't run. So how do you explain my patients that need TKRs, total knee replacements that, that have never run a day in their life? It, so it, it it's not, it's because that runner that's run for 40 or 50 years probably understands their technique very well, knows how to load share. And that action uh, that that motion is actually building cartilage because cartilage is coming again from that sclerotome. They're, it's coming from things like bone that respond to piece effect that encourage, you know, that that motion is lotion kind of technology of uh, of the body. And I think that cartilage should be a prime focus for for a lot of us being able to maintain it. And then we're seeing amazing things with stem cells being able to regrow it, but you don't want to regrow it and still have crappy biomechanics. So, you know, improving your mechanics and trying to create a, a load shared nourishment of the joint is, is going to promote cartilage building. And, and I tell runners that all the time and they're like, you're not going to tell me not to run. I'm like, no, I'm not going to tell you not to run. I mean, is it something you like to do? Yeah. Then I'm not going to kick your puppy. You should do what you love to do, but find a way for it not to be provocatory to your cartilage, find a way for it to nourish you. And if, you know, we need to, you know, change the, the running gait or we need to, to give you better joint centration so that you can not hit certain parts of the cartilage with excess, that would be, you know, a key point. But I think that the cartilage wear down is, is something that people should use as a health marker for their movement. Um, yeah, I completely agree on the running front. It was interesting to see the myths debunked in the literature, and yet you still to this day, and that happened in the 2000, like seven, eight, nine, ten range, the data started coming out about cartilage and running and how cartilage and runners look differently than cartilage and sedentary folks and then just controls, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And, and the interesting t tidbit is you still see the recommendation from – you know, the expert in need, the orthopedic surgeon, don't run, don't run. And it's like, well, the data would support otherwise. Evidence-based exactly evidence right. practice suggests otherwise. So I mean, I, I still I, have the, that argument I, I, today. 
it's it's crazy because the amount of TKRs that I've treated, even PKRs, partials that I that I've treated, none of those people were runners. <laughs> and almost always people get, you know, knee replacements because of our, you know, the articular cartilage wear down, this bone on bone that they're talked about, which they really just mean articular cartilage wear down. So I'm like I find that really odd that we're promoting these kind of old things when they they really don't make any clinical sense and they don't make any research sense. It doesn't really check out with an evidence based format. And the secondary part of it, the moment you tell somebody that enjoys an activity to start doing it, they become sedentary. And now you That's open exactly up right. the cascade for diabetes, heart disease, metabolic syndrome, and a partridge in a pear tree. High five, dog. I, 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 yeah, I, don't, I can I, go on and on. Don't, I, don't, I don't think that we should be talking people out of the things they love to do. And I, I don't think we should be vilifying the things that they love to do. Let's stop. There's just no evidence to support that that statement. There's more evidence to support that we should be promoting people to do what they love to do and do it well in a safe way that encourages uh, their their body to to rehabilitate well from it. That is where I think the future is. Yeah, and the secondary piece, mental health. Doing that activity has huge psychosocial benefits, which cannot be understated, especially coming off the heels of a pandemic where society became sedentary and isolated. So yeah, one of my running athletes recently yeah. had, um, they had a, a, a problem because we, we had assigned him to do skipping and uh, like some skipping, like uh, skipping intervals with sprinting intervals because jogging seemed to not really feel good on his body, but he loved to sprint. I'm like, oh, well, running can be a part of your life. Let's just do skipping. And, and well, we, I think we started with walking and, and skipping, then went to skipping and, and uh, walking, or sorry, skipping and sprinting. And so he loved it so much. But then with the cold weather, he was having like ankle pain. And I said, okay, well, you know, while we figure out your ankles and, and figure out some warming techniques for your ankles, uh, let's just take a little bit of a break from it doing it. And he said that was like the worst month ever because he enjoyed it so much. He loved it so much. It was like you said, the psychosocial component of it is a very, very big part of our perceptions of health. Um, so I'm really glad that you stated that because it's very, very true. He's back to running, by the way. But like it was, you know, we shouldn't be discouraging people that are really enjoying something to stop it. Do you know all these years, I think it took me all these years to kind of figure out what was the issue with telling somebody short term, I need you to stop doing something short term because of the stimulation for noise. You're yeah. inducing an identity crisis in somebody. Their identity is somehow some, some way tied up in the activity. And the moment you do that, you're challenging that person's perception about who they are. And then when I, when the, 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 the switch flipped in my mind, oh sh shoot, that's what's occurring. I'm like, I got to find a better way. Even, even if I say, I just need like a, a quarter of what you're doing short term, hey. like for a month, I need you to reduce it to like 75% to like a quarter volume. At least I didn't induce an a, a artificial doctor induced iatrogenic identity crisis. That's exactly right. It's not, so. it's not all or nothing. It's not an action potential. This is, you know, your ability to be able to, to, create a temporary limitation. I call them for my patients, just temporary restriction, just a temporary limitation. We're going to take your running from six miles to two miles. And then when you start to feel an escalating pain awareness, we know we have to stop because we're just trying to work with the body's pain signaling. And it just doesn't help us to run past that. It's not going to feel safe for you. And I, I do that with patients and they love it because I don't tell them not to do the thing. I tell them to do the thing differently and more safely. Doc, one last uh, anatomical consideration, and we'll wrap it up after this. Um, so I'm, I'm in Austin. Um, I'm, I'm a sports medicine doctor. I've seen more and more and more over the course of my career the products of overtraining syndrome, uh, kids working year-round, one sport, one sport development. And I'm getting the, the generation of athletes, especially young athletes, that, you know, um, heavy load, deep squat over and over and over. It seems to be the answer for all the world's problems. Are there anatomical considerations at play for lifting for the big lifts, like a squat, a deadlift, an overhead press, a clean, a jerk, and a snatch that would make somebody more selective to those activities and other people less selective for those activities? The two things that I, from an anatomic and clinical perspective, the two things that I temporary, temporarily restrict the most are overhead grinds, overhead presses, and squats. And the reason why is because we're working with like two, like in the shoulder, we talked about like th three physiological joints, six functional joints, the hip, 
the the two femurs moving on a relatively fixed pelvis. What I don't love about um, overhead pressing is the the harmony of the six joints that have to be you know, put into place. So I restrict people from that all the time. And I give them modification that seem like their body is pressing overhead, like landmine pressing or incline pressing uh, and, and just give them a temporary limitation. They're still pressing. You're not kicking their puppy. They're, they're not having an identity crisis, but uh, they're, they're still doing the thing that they like to do. It's just modified squatting. I am very happy to remove people from, I do not understand why it's a measure of anything. <laughs> really. I am a very big proponent of a lunge. Lunge has way more sports carryover. It works more total muscle groups. It's working oppositions of the limbs to work on a fixed pelvis. It, it does more for the runner, uh, which almost all sports have running. And a squat, you have to have both hips, knees, feet, centrating pretty generally symmetrically bilaterally for it to go the minor amount of well. I would tell you from my own practice, squatting is the least thing that I do every week of all the things that I do. And I just trade it off for lunging. And, and if someone has a joint centration problem, let's say on their left femur, their left single leg stance is messy and their right is not. The, the, I'm going to take them off of off squatting until they have that. And I'm going to demand them to learn more single leg or split stance activities that stabilize that femur, that knee, that foot. And because squatting doesn't serve them. I mean, I, I will never understand why a squat is used as any kind of marker for any sport other than squatting. Other than powerlifting. Yeah. It's ingrained in the culture that the back squat's like the gold standard of posterior chain development. And I always thought to myself, man, they're just better choices. So there, there are way better choices. And a back squat is, I mean, if I was going to maybe carry somebody out of a building, I, I not even that, I would still train a lunge. I would still train them to fling them over their shoulder and, and lunge with it. But I, I just don't get it. Like if you're talking about posterior chain development, you're in a position of relatively fixed external rotation. There's really no dynamism. And if I wanted to really build power on something, I'm going to pull, like if I want to flick a rubber band across the room, I'm going to pull the rubber band back and then fire it. So I would argue to the, to the grave about a squat, not dynamically doing much for the body um, as far as posterior chain development, unless you're talking about more anterior chain development, quads, but like yeah. there are so many better exercises for the glutes and hamstrings, particularly uh, things like lunging, split squat. Doc, so thank you for your time. Hey, do me a favor. Where can people find you? And and I know you teach some courses. What's upcoming on your course schedule, course roster? Oh, that's a long one. I, I teach a lot in the next coming months. So you can go to somaticsenses.com. I'm teaching courses in Canada and in Oregon through that amazing company. It's mostly chiropractors, but also physios that take those courses. Uh, some awesome stuff. We have some courses on temporomandibular joints and the vestibular system. Uh, those courses are pretty popular. Those are coming up. Um, I have courses with neurokinetic therapy, which is a manual muscle testing technique for proprioception uh, coming up in New York and Toronto. So you can go to neurokinetictherapy.com for that one. Uh, the immaculate courses are uh, all recorded online. And so there's six levels of that. There's um, core, upper, lower, uh, neck, jaw, uh, hand, uh, the peripheral nervous system, peripheral nerve entrapment. So the entire body, you learn nerve flosses for the whole body. And uh, then the movement subsystems, uh, the volumine subsystems of movement, like the deep longitudinal system, things like that. Uh, those courses are 15 hours each. They're all online. They're 300 bucks. They're not expensive. We made them dirt cheap so people could really just enjoy them and not worry about getting hit in the pocketbook. And then we have 10, I believe, anatomy angel courses, which are five hour short courses from TMJ to menopause to um, the vestibular system to sciatica. We just did one recently on peripheral nerve entrapments at the upper extremity, uh, like the big five branches of the brachial plexus. And so if you want to learn some nerve flosses of the upper body and, and really a really good neurological exam, that, that's a, a good course to take. And so those are all available online. Uh, those are on immaculatedissection.com. So hopefully you can join us live or in person for something. You can always email me with questions, drkathydooley.com. Hopefully I can answer them. And we'll put all the uh, links that Dr. Dooley mentioned in the show notes for those interested. I will put a plug in for the uh, Immaculate. And that's your baby. That's your puppy. Yep. That's, that's <laughs> yes. the thing that she created. I have seen some of the, the entry-level videos and she does a really phenomenal job in explaining and using actually live models, if I'm not mistaken, 
and taking them through assessment motions. So you get to see the anatomy moving. They use a really talented artist who does body drawing. Uh, am I saying it right? Body drawing? Yeah. yeah. Um, anatomic art. Yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah. It's an anatomic art. So it looks like a, a live moving netters variation. And she explains <laughs> in real time what's stabilizing, what's moving and how to break those down further. So I'll put a plug in for that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, we would love for you to join us live or in person for any of, of, of those things. So, and, and if you're not available for that, there's a lot of free content on my YouTube, Dr. Duly Noted. So uh, you're welcome to grab some stuff from there for free and see if you like it first before you decide to invest in a course. Doc, thanks so much for your time and your talents and all your wisdom. It's great catching up again and wish you the thank best you. Of, uh, of luck out in Boulder and in, in New York. And Occasionally, I stop by the great state of Colorado. So if I'm I'm uh, there, I'll hit you up and we'll go out and share share some food or grab a beer. Amazing! And congratulations to all your success as well and your success with the podcast. Thanks, Doc. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time and your talents. Bye. Bye.